So it's a great pleasure this uh, this morning. God, it doesn't feel like the afternoon. But it's a great pleasure to introduce Stan Jawinski, who's a, a principal engineer at the Great Fisheries, the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, and they're charged with if essentially developing methodologies to prevent the spread of invasive fish species in the Great Lakes system. It's a kind of unusual organization. It's an intergovernmental organization because it's funded by both the US and the Canadian government to protect the Great, the Great Lakes. Uh, Dan is a former student in our department. He got his PhD, advised by Mickey and myself, and then he went on to the St. Paul campus and worked with Peter Sorensen, who's in the audience, who uh, is in the, was, was an amateurist professor in the fisheries department and postdoc with him before he joined the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And um, Dan had a very uh, eclectic PhD thesis. He studied a, a wide variety of things. I've got them written down here, including instability, agent-based modeling, which should be of interest to some of the people in transportation, computational fluid dynamics, fish physiology, and some say even fractional calculus. So he did a very wide range of things. And I think that he was able to bring all of those things together to apply them to looking at developing effective fish barriers, not just in the Great Lakes systems, but throughout the globe. And I think he's developed a very strong reputation in the time that he's graduated and he was being an expert in that field, actually understanding the underlying science between the fish barriers. And I think he's going to demonstrate, I know, I don't think, I know he's going to demonstrate that kind of broad sense of the skill set that he has when he's looking at this uh, on a project which is about to start that's been ongoing for some time, Fish Passage, and look at how all of those different aspects that he's developed in the computation of fluid, and fluid dynamics, physiology, et cetera, come to bear on that problem to prevent the spread of sea lamprey. And I'm sure he'll talk about how nasty that species is to the ecology of the Great Lakes system. So Dan, the floor's yours. All right, thank you. Um, as mentioned, I work for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Um, it's a binational treaty organization uh, between the US and Canada. Our head office is actually in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's called the Secretariat. Um, but I am located actually in Traverse City, which is the home of my project that I lead, which is Fish Pass. Um, so if, if you're familiar with Michigan at all, I'll take out my handy map. Traverse City is about right here. Um, so that kind of puts you geographically where, where I'm located and where this project takes place. And what I'm gonna talk about today is really the exploration of the science supporting selective fish passage that will be developed and implemented at Fish Pass, um, which its long name is Bidirectional Selective Fish Passage Project, but it's just easier to say Fish Pass. Um, so what you'll see today is really the culmination of about seven years of research, uh, design, planning, and implementation done by a, a contribution of, of almost 100 biologists, engineers, social scientists, uh, and, and agency representatives. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to recognize all of our project partners and project funders as, as shown by the logos below. Um, so I'm gonna start today by talking about or introducing the concept of the connectivity conundrum. And this is really the dealing with the impact of barriers and fragmented watersheds um, around the world and not just in the Great Lakes. And then I'll talk about more specifically how this is being played out in the boardman Ottaway River in Traverse City, Michigan, and how Fish Pass seeks to solve that problem through selective fish passage development. So connectivity uh, within a river or between a river and its receiving water is really critical to the life history traits of a lot of fish, as well as just general watershed health. Um, but barriers in the form of dams and road crossings uh, block that connectivity. Um, and this does have, you know, sometimes barriers do have a, an important role in blocking movement of invasive species. Um, and this is really what gives rise to the connectivity conundrum. And this is managing the ultimate management decision between barrier removal for increased connectivity versus retaining a barrier for invasive species control. You know, when we focus in on the Great Lakes, there's already a network of almost 250,000 barriers that block the movement of uh, an estimated 120 uh, migratory fish species. Now, included with that migratory fish species is the blockage of invasive species. And there are numerous invasive species in the Great Lakes, but arguably none have had a more devastating impact than the invasive sea lamprey. Um, so this is a you know, very ancient looking fish. 
Um, I've got an example of it right here. This is about what they look like in the Great Lakes. Um, they are native to the Atlantic Ocean, um, but they gained access to the Great Lakes in the early 19th century through the construction of the Welland Canal and Erie Canal. Once they gained access to the Great Lakes, because of their devastating feeding habits in which they attach to fish out in the Great Lakes and feed on their blood and other bodily fluids, usually resulting in killing that fish, um, they've contributed to the near collapse of lake trout and lake whitefish populations. Um, and in response to that uh, fisheries collapse, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was formed. And one of our major roles is the control or coordinated uh, control of sea lamprey. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the, the adults will live out in the Great Lakes and they'll feed on fish. But then once they cease feeding, they, they'll migrate into tributaries to be able to spawn, in which after they spawn, the adults die and the larvae will stay in those tributaries for three to four years before metamorphosing, moving back out downstream and then starting the process over again. So the control mechanisms that the Great Lakes Fishery Commission relies on is really uh, grounded in, in two tools. The first is a chemical lamprecide. Uh, this is a near species specific uh, chemical that's applied to tributaries and near shore areas where sea lamprey spawn and it kills their larvae. The other tool are barriers. So it prevents sea lamprey from gaining access to those tributaries um, and having the added effect of then it reduces the amount of lamprecides that are required to uh, use to, to remove uh, the larvae. Now this, this uh, control program has been largely successful. Um, it's reduced sea lamprey populations to less than 90% of the historic peak. And this is all protecting a fishing industry that's estimated at worth about you know, $9 billion. Um, however, those barriers that block sea lamprey access also have an unintended consequences of blocking many of our native migratory species that use those same tributaries and that same spawning habitat uh, to, to complete their life, life history. Now, obviously, complete barrier removal is a recognizable solution to this connectivity problem. However, full connectivity can have unintended consequences for both desirable and undesirable species. Um, so what we've kind of the, what the Great Lakes Fish Commission has, has started with this project is trying to develop selective fish passage tools so we can actually pass desirable species while blocking and or removing those that are undesirable. Now, sorting systems, you know, the, the, the goal of selective fish passage kind of boils down to just sorting an assortment of things. And there aren't a lot of examples of sorting, uh, sorting organisms in the uh, natural, natural world. So, uh, we actually turn to other industries for inspiration on how we might achieve this for uh, selective fish passage. And what we actually look to is the material recycling industry. This may seem like a rather odd analogy, but if you think about it, both sectors are trying to solve the same problem. You get a collection of items or a mixture of items, and you want to be able to sort out those that are desirable from those that are undesirable. And it's really the evolution from the single stream recycling process uh, that informs kind of approaches and expectations that we can apply to fish passage. And primarily those are focusing on automation and attribute-driven sorting. Now, when I talk about attribute-driven sorting in the material, industry, material recycling industry, this is, you don't pick out uh, paper because it's paper. You don't pick out cardboard because it's cardboard or metal because it's metal. You, use, you focus on the attributes of the material themselves and be able to sort all of them based on those same attributes. So whether it's size, density, its shape, uh, whether it's magnetic um, or coloration, um, those are all the tools that are, are used in re material recycling. And we want to apply that same approach to the attributes uh, imbued by fish. Um, now, obviously fish are volitional. They can respond to their environment. So it's a little bit different from material recycling. And, and that's why we have to focus in on both the ecology and biology of, of the fish and their environment um, and incorporate that into the environment or the engineering design at the onset. So when I talk about the attributes of fish, we can kind of boil this down into four primary categories. The first is the phenology. This is the run timing or movement timing of fish. You know, through a lot of study and, and, and historic uh, evidence, we know fish move into rivers, especially their migratory movements occur at very distinct times. And this is all influenced by environmental signals, whether it be increases in discharge, water temperature, uh, water stage changes, or presence of pheromones. Fish will move at, at distinct times. And we can understand that uh, through telemetry studies and, and uh, observing their movement. Um, and this is already used in seasonal berries in the Great Lakes. So berries are only present when sea lamprey are running, um, but then they're removed when sea lamprey aren't running. The one downside to that is because sea lamprey tend to have the same, they tend to overlap in terms of their movement timing as a lot of our native species. So it's not a universal solution. Um, so then we look at other, other attributes like morphology, so the size and shape of a fish. Um, 
This is already used in the Great Lakes through the use of screens or traps to be able to sort fish based on their size. Um, but also raises an interesting opportunity to use things like image recognition to be able to identify fish based on you know, their fin position, eye position, size, shape, and, and coloration. Um, and then obviously behavior is one of the attributes that's more unique to a living organism than, uh, than the material recycling industry. And this is because fish can respond to their environment. And through a lot of studies, usually in kind of one-off situations with individual species or individual uh, tools, we know, you know, fish will have responses to their environment like bubbles, sound, light, turbulence, uh, velocity profiles, or naturally occurring uh, chemicals and pheromones. Um, and as effectively, we can use their behavior to incite kind of self-sorting. Um, and then finally, we have their physiology. So rather than I'm in physiology, we're not necessarily talking about their ability to detect those uh, environmental signals that elicit those behaviors. This is kind of their ability to overcome challenges, whether that be a vertical challenge, whether they build, are able to jump over a barrier or swim at high speeds against what would be deemed a velocity barrier or their ability to attach to surfaces or in the kind of unique case in the lower right hand corner is an eel style ladder, which sea lamprey in the Great Lakes are the only fish that's actually able to climb those um, versus any other of our fin species or fin fish. Um, and as I said, you know, a lot of these tools have already been kind of tested in individual cases. Um, and what we see as fish bass being the, the greatest benefit is it'll provide the capacity to integrate a lot of these tools for the first time. And that's where we see the most innovation in terms of selective fish patches is going to be gained. So the number of attributes, as I showed, you know, is, can be quite vast. And the number of fish that we could potentially sort is also quite fast. So we started going through a process in which we actually looked at what are all the known migratory species in the Great Lakes, including those that are you know, introduced or could be introduced, including like the uh, invasive carps. And we generated a list of about 220 species. And we were able to find enough data to be able to fill out a, a list of about 21 sortable attributes. Many of those are, are the ones I just talked about for each of those species. Now, if you think about that, the possible combination of 220 species, 21 sortable attributes, can be a, a quite a complicated problem. And we know from historic single factor designs of you know, just a, focusing on a single attribute is largely ineffective for uh, sorting or passage of fish outside of uh, salmonids. So that's why we looked into taking an effort of kind of differentiating or grouping based on those attributes rather than a species by species uh, approach. Um, and while I don't expect you to be able to read every single one of those items, these are each line represents a, an individual fish. And this is a guild analysis that was done that attempted to group fish based on those 21 sortable attributes. And what I wanna point, point out is really like kind of the broad grouping of fish. Um, we can start to get an idea of how we might apply some of these attributes for, for purposes of sorting. And, and I'll bring attention to this first cluster, which is where sea lamprey and a lot of our kind of larger native species, uh, migratory species show up like long nose sucker, white sucker, Northern pike, uh, lake sturgeon, all kind of fall in this group green uh, guild. And what we see is like they're, they're grouped based on their migratory behavior. They move generally in the spring. They've got small eyes. This is where you have fish that have electroreceptors so they can detect uh, electrical fields a little bit better. Um, and these differ from some of these other species that might be smaller, move at different times of the year. So like cluster four is where you have all the uh, introduced salmonids, which are again, larger fish, but tend to move in the fall. And this just kind of gives you a, a, a quick image of how you might start to, to utilize some of those attributes to be able to divide fish into distinct groups. And this will all be implemented at Fish Pass. So uh, taking a kind of broader step back, Fish Pass is really, the, its goal is to provide upstream and downstream passage of desirable fish while simultaneously blocking and or, or removing undesirable species. And we'll do this through three objectives. The first is obviously to testing different configurations of these sorting tools, uh, implement the a protocol that works for the fish community of the Boardman River, and then be able to set those solutions within a global context so we can apply this at other sites. So prior to fish pass starting, uh, the Boardman River, uh, which is located kind of northern lower peninsula of Michigan, uh, was the focus of a multi-year, multi-agency uh, stream restoration project. It was the largest in the state of Michigan. And what they sought to do was remove the three upstream dams, which is the Sabin Dam, Boardman Dam, and Brownbridge Dam. Uh, and then modify the last remaining barrier, which is the Unistreet Dam, which is located uh, about a mile from uh, Lake Michigan. Now, these dam removals 
greatly increase connectivity in the system and improve fishery habitat. However, it does leave the system vulnerable to sea lamprey access because if you think about it, instead of having a system that has four redundant barriers, it's now down to just one barrier that has a history of sea lamprey escapement. So because of that, that question of what to do with uh, the Union Street Dam, that brought the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in to partner with federal and uh, state agencies and the local community to be able to implement this project at the Union Street Dam. And really it's, it's the, the long-term goal of Fish Pass to be able to provide that selective passage so that you can fully connect the Boardman River with its receiving water of Lake Michigan. So here's a, a quick image of what Fish Pass uh, will look like compared to the existing conditions. Just to kind of orient yourself, the river is, is running from the bottom of the screen to the top, uh, where it discharges in Lake Michigan kind of just on the, on the right. And essentially you'll, you'll see that, you know, we'll replace the existing dam with an improved barrier with selective fish passage capabilities. Once it's constructed, uh, we'll optimize it, optimize various sorting technologies all below a barrier. So essentially we're, we're testing the technologies rather than testing on the river. Um, during that time, we'll develop the site into a living laboratory with focus on academic research and community learning. And at the end, once we identify the configuration of tools that work for the fish, fish community and fish community objectives of the Borden River, convert it to a, a permanent selective fishway, and then start exporting that process to other sites. So in this image, this kind of gives you a, a little bit more detail on all the aspects of fish pass. And, and while I usually talk about all the kind of ancillary features, I'm gonna focus on ju those just related to the selective fish passage research. And that starts with the fish, sor fish pass sorting channel, which is the, the channel you see on the bottom here. It's essentially a 400 foot long, 30 foot wide concrete flume um, in which we'll do most of the, the uh, selective passage research. It's built with adaptability in mind. So it has uh, slots every five feet throughout its length to be able to install different tools. It has a removable partition so we can split it into two separate channels or, or leave it as one full channel. Um, and then we also have built-in uh, telemetry arrays to be able to track fish as they, they move through that. And then we also have a uh, mobile data carriage and gantry crane to be able to not just move around those tools as different fish arrive, but also be able to quantify what the environment is that they're encountering. And at the upstream end, we have a dual head gate system to, to again, modulate the flow within the fish sorting channel while still maintaining a barrier at the upstream end. Uh, on the other side of the channel is this nature-like bypass channel. And this was designed to have a natural aesthetic and, and provide all the regulatory flood flows for the river. Um, it has vegetated banks, in-stream habitat in terms of riffle section and engineered log jams. Uh, and then at the upstream end, water is controlled by a complete barrier uh, in the form of an arc labyrinth weir. And what's interesting about the selection of that is it, it, it provides a lot of discharge capacity within a, a small footprint, because you can see there's buildings on either side, either bank of the river. So we don't have the, the room to be able to put in like a 120 foot long weir. So it, by having that unique shape, it's able to pass a lot of flow in a safe manner because it doesn't generate the kind of dangerous hydraulics you typically see uh, downstream of, of low head dams. And this, this bifurcated channel design was done purposely to be able to accommodate a lot of recreational use and access of the river uh, and research use at the same time so that they didn't you know, kind of interfere with each other. So one of the first steps we had with the design of Fish Pass was be able to make sure that this is an improved barrier. And this may, may seem counterintuitive for a project that's fish passage based, um, but if you think about it, you can't have selective fish passage if there's uncontrolled passage of fish. So to, to base that design, we looked at really primarily two species. One is obviously sea lamprey. We wanna make sure sea lamprey are blocked. Uh, and then we also looked at the uh, salmonid passage, which is kind of at the other extreme, whereas sea lamprey don't jump, they have to swim through to cross a barrier. Salmon will obviously jump uh, and have quite prolific abilities at doing that. Um, and the reason why we wanna be able to block salmon passages, they're an introduced species to the Great Lakes. There are a lot of recreational um, and economical interest in the Great Lakes. But depending on which tributary you're in, they can have, um, they can compete with some of the native uh, species that are resident in rivers. So because of all the restoration that was going on in the Borden River, there was an emphasis by the community and supported by the DNR and local tribe to be able to uh, essentially include Salmon Salmonid passage during the first 10 years of the project. Um, so when we talk about being able to block fish, uh, sea lamprey are, are, are a pretty easy one. Um, because of you know, a history of uh, an array of almost 420 barriers in the Great Lakes, we know that as long as we're able to maintain a 45 centimeter differential between the crest of the structure to the tailwater, sea lamprey are effectively blocked. Um, once that differential is lost, it becomes a much more nebulous question. 
Um, however, with Salmonids, because they can jump, it takes a much more nuanced approach to be able to analyze whether they can pass a, a structure or not. Um, so to do that, we actually uh, use a ballistic uh, trajectory model to be able to calculate whether different size steelhead are able to, or steelhead or, and salmon are able to jump over any of these barriers. And we did this by uh, calibrating the model using image images that we captured at the existing dam. So we're able to calculate the fish length, their velocity exiting the water, and then also the angle of approach that they take. And then we combine that with CFD modeling to be able to, to uh, correlate not, not only their leaping speed, but how they actually orient to the flow uh, to select that kind of optimal trajectory. And some of the interesting results is that we found once the velocity reaches about you know, half a meter per second to a meter per second, that difference angle between the angle that the fish jumps and the angle of the velocity vector just before they breach the surface decreases. So you know, it's, it's kind of logical that the stronger the, the signal from the falling water, the greater chance that they have to uh, acquire a, a leap angle that matches that. And all this information is just generally used to be able to evaluate different flow conditions at the uh, fish pass structure so we can estimate you know, how effective is it going to be at blocking these fish. And what we see is sea lamprey are generally blocked up to 100 year storm, which makes this the probably most robust sea lamprey barrier in the Great Lakes. Um, and then steelhead, because of the leaping ability, it, it decreases down to about 25 year event. Um, but what's nice is we are able to identify that at about a five year event, there does become an incremental risk of passage. So we have uh, plan slab to be have, have in increased monitoring, whether it be through uh, surveillance um, or uh, additional fish surveys at, at those times. And you can kind of see that dating back to 1952 flows in that river um, show that these, these estimates are rather uh, conservative. So kind of moving on to just the general operations of how fish pass will work. Um, this kind of gives the, the base operations. It's kind of what you'd imagine. Uh, in this case, the rotor is moving from right to left. So fish moving upstream would be moving from left to right. And in its base condition, you have you know, fish basically making a decision to, to move into either the fish sorting channel, which is the only route that there's passage capabilities, or they can move into that nature-like bypass channel. And although it's designed at that entrance pad to have relatively uniform conditions, so there isn't a bias of fish going one way or the other, um, we do anticipate that you know, fish do respond in, in ways that we don't quite understand. So to accommodate that, we can also operate it so that we can close the gates at the downstream end of the fish sorting channel and open up gates at the upstream end. So it operates very similar to a traditional fishway in which that entrance is located uh, adjacent to the main spillway. And all of this is just to provide additional opportunities for fish to encounter those tools that we envision will be able to, to sort them. So kind of taking a step back to the, the parallel mechanics between single stream recycling or the recycling industry and fish passage, we can kind of see that they're, they both break down into four kind of sequential stages. That first one is the collection or approach. This is just bringing the fish to the site. You know, unlike in material recycling, we don't need a packer truck to load up and bring fish in because fish move, bring themselves. So the river acts as that conveyance structure. Uh, next, you have disintegration, disintegration and conditioning or entry. And this is kind of that first first stage of, of kind of some sorting and opportunities, but also introduces the idea of being able to condition fish for more predict predictable responses to stimuli later on. Um, the third step is the, the main sorting process. So this is where you have kind of iterations of different tools being used, you know, sending fish through the same tool multiple times to eventually weed out those that are undesirable um, before you reach the upstream end, which we focus on as fate. And that's just an assessment of how effective were we at selecting uh, desirable species and how many of those do we actually pass? And right now I'm gonna go in and focus on some of the research that we've been doing into each of these four main stages for selective fish passage. So starting with the approach phase, as I mentioned, this is, you know, this is really relying on the phenology of fish when they move into the system. So one of the first strategies we have here is just assessing when fish arrive to the site and, and tying that to the environmental conditions. And we do that through a lot of different telemetry studies, as well as uh, DITS and sonar uh, surveys to be able to assess when fish are present. And although you can't see on this, I, I don't expect you to read every single line on here. Essentially what it shows is you know, kind of the presence of fish within the lower Boardman River. And you see that there's a lot of overlap. So when we expect sea lamprey to arrive, which is right on the third line there, you see that that's the same time we'd expect fish like walleye, rainbow trout, northern pike, uh, lake sturgeon all arrive at that same time. So when, when we start identifying what tools we might use, we know that when we're dealing with sea lamprey, we're going to have all those other desirable fish. And then we also have 
uh, environmental sensing to be able to track, you know, temperature, discharge, river stage, uh, all within the river at the same time. So we can tie those together. So we can kind of predict in the future at what times we might see different species. Uh, now, although I did say that this is an opportunity where we can, we aren't going to influence a lot of, of sorting, but there is an opportunity because there has been enough, a lot of research on uh, pheromones, which are uh, natural produced chemicals by sea lamprey larvae that adults use to be able to I identify uh, suitable habitat for spawning. So they essentially follow that, that scent. And uh, you can envision you might want to apply this pheromone to streams where maybe either lamprecide treatments are more effective or you could attract them to fish pass because you have the infrastructure to be able to remove them so you don't have to treat those other sites. So that's just one example of how we might induce some sorting um, at this approach phase. So next we move on to entry. So this is the first opportunity to really influence fish behavior. Um, and as I said, we have this entrance pan that's designed to create as uniform flow conditions as possible um, because we know fish generally do are able to respond to their the fluid environment, they have mechanical and sensory lateral lines, which is able to detect uh, variations in turbulence and kind of bulk flow conditions around their body. Um, so one of the things that is a challenge for fish bass is being able to, to quantify what the velocity conditions are at the time when fish are approaching. And one of the tools that we've been developing with researchers from Cornell is using uh, infrared quantitative image velocimetry. So this is essentially using IR cameras to track minute differences in temperature between the water surface and the atmosphere. And as that evacs downstream, you get these little cells that are generated by turbulence as the water is just moving across the uh, uneven bed of the river. And you can track those very similar to how you can with uh, particle image velocimetry. And then you can produce uh, velocity fluctuation fields and, and bulk flow uh, at the water surface. And what's really nice about this tool um, that we plan to use at Fish Pass is that it can do so at a really large scale. So this is a 20 meter wide section of the river um, and, it, and about 30 meters long. So it has a lot of uh, coverage. It calculates down to uh, probably about two to three centimeters depending on which camera is used. And it takes samples at about a 30 Hertz uh, sampling rate. So it produces a lot of information that can be quantified at almost near real time uh, aspects. And what's, what's nice with this is now we can monitor what the, the flow conditions are at the downstream entrance, but we also might be able to use uh, specific signals to be able to attract fish to one channel or the other. And one of the, one of the studies that we've done is use this flow velocity enhancement system, which is essentially a submerged venturi pump to create a, a plume of turbulence. And in an open river system, we've actually used that to kind of guide sea lamprey from one side of the river to the other. So you can see this is one way that we can start to direct fish into specific channels and be able to monitor how they're actually responding to it. So now we're moving on to the main uh, sorting and passage phase. Uh, and this really relies on pretty much every attribute uh, at our disposal. And some of the examples that we might think of is, you know, obviously using screens to be able to sort out fish. And this is something that's taken from the material recycling industry is that you want to be able to isolate really large objects, really large fish, so they don't have to deal with you know, the, the size differences in species. So if you can imagine, if we can pick out really obvious species like lake sturgeon right away, because they're you know, six feet long, then you don't have to have processes all the way through that has to deal with a six foot long sturgeon and six inch perch at the same time. Um, so that's just kind of one of the, the logical first steps. And this can also rely on, you know, so using morphology can also uh, bring up the idea of image recognition, which I'll, I'll provide an example of in a second here. And then also we have velocity barriers. You know, we know these fish have different capabilities, different swimming performances. And on this graph, it just kind of shows that species over on the right-hand side are ones that can maintain higher velocities for longer periods of time versus those that are on, those that are on the left. And sea lamprey kind of fall up more or less on the, on the left-hand side there. So when we talk about image recognition, um, we've been working with researchers from Central Michigan University and a company called Woosh Innovations. Um, if you are not familiar with them, just Google salmon cannon, and you'll you'll get some pretty nice imagery. Um, that's essentially a wetted tube that they use to shoot salmon over, uh, uh, transport salmon over large dams out west. But they also developed this tool, which is essentially a wetted slide that has cameras placed, so you can take high resolution images of fish. You can take about 18 images within less than a second, and you can use those images, feed that into a machine learning algorithm to be able to identify species just based on uh, their, their photo. 
And the, the project that we did, we went around the Great Lakes um, and took pictures of, I think it was about 1,500 different fish to train up that, that algorithm. And so far, using the, that full ensemble of images, it's able to identify sea lamprey from all the other species at a rate of 99.9%. .9%. So that's a really effective tool. Um, and it's able to do that because you're dewatering the fish so you get really clear images versus if you're trying to take images of fish when they're in the water and you have issues like turbidity or multiple fish at, it, that are present. Now, obviously the challenge then is fish don't typically want to dewater themselves. So that's where we actually paired up a very old technology, which is an Archimedes screw. Um, so this prototype is, it's a three foot diameter and it rotates at about 12 rep, uh, rotations per minute and use that to just continuously provide access to be able to scoop up fish and water and lift them up into the image uh, slide. And a test we did of this in a sea lamprey trap in 2021, we were able to pass uh, 700 long nose suckers and white suckers in, in a matter of about a week. And it was all done safely. So it's a, a tool that we're still trying to develop and being able to attract fish to it, but it is something that is a potential tool to use at fish pass. Um, and then back to the idea of the velocity barrier. Again, we know fish have different uh, abilities to swim against uh, high velocities. And this is work that's done by Ted Castro Santos at the USGS Conti and Adramus, uh, Fish Lab. And what, he, what, sh what you see here is, you know, distance is on the x-axis and proportion of fish that make it that distance is on the, on the y-axis. And you can see that these lamprey, um, when they're able to attach to, to the side of the flume, I mean, they're able to make it up, you know, about nine meters or so, even at four meters per second, which is a really high velocity. But as soon as you prevent their ability to attach, so they just pry this honeycomb surface, you know, now that drops down to significantly uh, shorter distance that they can they can travel. And, and one of the biggest differences is when you see like the two meters per second uh, approaches, instead of every single fish able to make it all the way to the top of the flume, now you have, you know, less than 50% are only making it 15 meters. So this is a potential tool we can use um, essentially by lining one channel with attachment inhibiting surfaces and one that doesn't so that you can provide access for sea lamprey to make it up one side while our other fin fish are able to move up the other side. Again, this is just another option. Uh, and then one of the last ones I'll give an example of is the alarm cue. So this is essentially just ground up uh, extract from a ground up sea lamprey. Um, and, it, and it makes sense that you know, fish are gonna avoid the smell of death pretty much. And you can see they have a very strong response to that, that signal. Um, now they, they can habituate if, they're, if there's prolonged uh, exposure to this, but there has been research um, by the Wagner Lab at MSU to be able to apply kind of in a pulse concentration to effectively keep them out from a fish wave. Um, so you can envision we might wanna pump that down the fish sorting channel so we have less lamprey to deal with, and then they can go down the, the fish sorting or the bypass channel where it's a, a, a barrier. So this is just a conceptual image that I think does a good job of just kind of highlighting how we might pair these tools together. So again, starting with sorting fish based on their size using screens. Um, in this case, using image recognition to maybe trigger a gate opening or a trap uh, function. Um, then sorting fish based on their behavior, whether they will jump over a barrier or not. Uh, also their responses to environmental cues like bubbles, sound, light, or even playing off of preferences in water depth that they, they'll swim. And then pairing that all with traps so we can effectively collect, collect those fish and pass or, or remove them depending on what species it is. Now, we have a lot of different configurations that are possible. I mean, there's, there's 50 years of research on sea lamprey behavior, well over 100 years of, of research on passage and guidance of other fish species. So there's a lot of different tools that are at our disposal. And learning again from the material cycling industry, trial and error is really inefficient at being able to identify what we'd wanna look at. And with a project that only has a 10 year uh, window to be able to develop these tools, it's really critical that we're efficient with how we evaluate things. So what we're using, planning to use is a Bayesian separation method that is, allows us to kind of focus on what those optimal configurations are. So instead of having a suite of 30 different configurations, you know, we can winnow it down to just two that we might test within each season. Um, so this is, it's really a simple approach. It's just a probabilistic approach to model binary separating systems. So you have a separating process. You have some uh, proportion of desirable and undesirable fish, and they get separated into a, a primary or secondary outlet. And those are just governed by uh, efficacies of R and Q. So R just says, this is the percentage of fish 
of the desirable species that will direct towards the primary route, and Q is uh, the alternative for undesirable fish going to the secondary route. And there's a lot of different operations that can are possible because you have feedback loops. So even in a, in a simple case of just two separating process, that it generates 32 possible iterations that you need to evaluate. Um, so as you start to think about how we might apply this to fish pass, we're going to be dealing with more than two processes, so it gets a bit more nebulous. But generally, it creates a, a system of equations through mass balance. And even in that simple case uh, where we have two processes, one is really good at blocking undesirable, so it's got a high Q value, and another one that has a really high R value, so good at passing desirable species. You can see, depending on the ratio of desirable to undesirable fish, really skews the performance of these uh, different configurations. And I just want to highlight, like in grade here, this shows if it's a one, which is really desirable, that means there's no undesirable species that are making it through. Lower values are you have a lot of undesirable fish. So you can kind of track based on the colors, depending on the ratio of fish that come in, that really does skew uh, the relative performance. So this is just, again, a way where we might isolate on, you know, just the light blue or the, the auburn colors as tools that we might want to evaluate versus some of the ones that are obviously not very effective. So once we actually get these tools into the fish sorting channel and want to evaluate how they perform, we track fish using passive integrative transponders. So this, these are small microchips that we implant in fish. And as they move through, uh, the antennas detect when those tags move through. So you're able to track the time and location of, of each individual. And we have a network of almost uh, well over 20 antennas that we plan to have it, it in uh, operation. So we can track fish as they move through either the bypass channel or the fish sorting channel. And with all that data, you know, what do we do with it? How do we actually assess what's influencing fish uh, responses? And we use a time to event analysis essentially to be able to integrate those covariate effects, even including time varying covariates. So looking at changes in temperature, discharge, water level, you know, operation of different sorting tools, all on impacts on fish passage rates and route selection. So we're able to look at rates of approach, entry into either the channels and then eventual passage. Because there's always the opportunity that fish will reject um, moving into each one of those different changes. And even within the fish sorting channel, you can envision with each sorting tool, you can evaluate this whole process again. Um, so it just gives us a, a, a broad framework on how we might assess uh, the overall performance of a specific configuration. But we're also interested in individual uh, behaviors of fish. So we use a we have plans to use an individual-based model uh, called the Eulerian Lagrangian Agent Method. So this was developed by Andy Goodwin, who's with uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and the, he developed for uh, cell, you know, juvenile salmonids out west, but it is now being applied to sea lamprey movement. And essentially, what it does is it, it allows you to combine uh, positional data of fish. So using acoustic tag to track fish as they move through their environment, and pairing that with high-resolution hydraulic information typically in the form of CFD models, but we might in the future be able to use data from like the, the IRQIV to do it in more real time. But essentially being able to pair those and then have uh, rules that govern their behavior in response to those variables. And in an example of where we've done this in the St. Mary's River, which is the, the body of water that connects the uh, Lake Huron to Lake Superior, there's a, the Sioux Locks, which is a large lock complex that allows passage of fish or passage of boats and also has a number of hydropower facilities. And essentially, we use this model to evaluate sea lamprey movement at a relatively broad scale. And we find that you know, basically their behaviors are dominated by flow velocity dependent orientation, orientation towards um, precursors of, of turbulence and spatial velocity gradient and TKE, and then also dependent on their previous experience. So they learn behaviors on how to uh, move through. And, and that's where we're able to evaluate um, kind of individual uh, responses to their environment so that I could potentially use to kind of predict how fish might respond to future uh, changes. So finally, that gets us to our, our fate stage, um, which is not really a sorting process, but it's really an evaluation stage. And one of the things that we do now, even before fish pass is just constructed, is we look at where fish are coming from. So this, this is showing the movement of, the, the yellow and blue dots are movement of lake trout in Lake Michigan. You can see they're all coming back to, to the Borden River, but you know you have a few that are, heading all the way over to the Green Bay. Um, so these fish are moving and collecting uh, nutrients and energy from a lot of different places in the Great Lakes and bringing them all back into the tributaries um, that can then be deposited and used for those fish that are resident. Um, so 
that's what we're doing now, but we also want to look at where our fish going. So once they are passed, how far up in the watershed do they actually go? And we've got a project right now looking at long nose sucker and white sucker movement, and we're seeing them move you know, about 10 to anywhere between 10 and 15 miles upstream. Um, so we can kind of evaluate what habitats they're using and, and whatnot. Um, but with that, you know, those fish are collecting all those nutrients and energy, but also contaminants out in the Great Lakes. And as they move back in, as we provide passage to those fish, you know, that might lead to deposition of contaminants that were not present within the, the tributaries. So we have a study that's looking at that and kind of what you'd expect, some of the uh, fish that are lower on the food chain, so like the suckers that move in really large numbers, um, they have relatively low concentrations of PCB and mercury versus those that are kind of apex predators like salmon uh, have really high concentrations of mercury and PCB. So if they move up and die after reproducing, they can uh, uh, deposit a lot of contaminants that might impact the upstream uh, fish population. And also just looking at gene flow, like are fish actually contributing to the fish population upstream of a barrier and, and future year classes um, after. So before I conclude, I just want to show that, you know, th this image kind of exemplifies how interdisciplinary and uh, multi-agency this project is. We have uh, an advisory board that kind of directs the project um, with uh, members from the Grand Traverse Band of Triple Nado Indians, the Michigan D DNR, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the USGS and, and the City of Traverse City. And then we have a science team that's composed of about 20 experts in fish passage and, and, and engineering. Uh, from a number of different universities and also those agencies. And this is all in conjunction with the local authorities because this is in a, a very visible location. So we have an expectation that the public is gonna have a, a, a big role in uh, participating and just observing the research that's going on. And it gives us a unique opportunity to uh, be able to elicit uh, public uh, knowledge on the con issues concerning invasive species, barriers, connectivity, and, and just history of the site. So the project timeline, um, we actually went through all the design phase starting back in 2015, had a completed design in 2020. It went out to bid uh, for about $19.7 million. Um, however, a private citizen sued the city over an alleged disposal of parkland, which unfortunately caused a about a two and a half year delay. Um, but we uh, were able to get clearance from the uh, judicial system in Michigan uh, just in September. So we're now working through uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and the contractor to be able to renegotiate that contract in which we'll hopefully start construction on this site uh, within the next three to six months. Um, and we expect about two years for construction. And then after that, it'll be a 10 year uh, research and optimization phase. Uh, and with that, I hope to answer any questions if there's time. Uh, thank you. Oh, great presentation, that was really awesome. Uh, the question that I do have, excuse me, um, for the sorting and the passage phase, how do you know that when you're doing all the sorting, you're not changing the habitat? So, so within the, the fish sorting channel, it, it is an artificial, it's an engineered habitat. Um, but one of the things that we, we have as kind of in our back pocket that we might look at is one of the, the passage tools that works really well um, when you replace barriers is like rock ramps or natural fishways. Um, we have the, the ability to kind of emulate those types of conditions within the fish sorting channel. So you may have those tools, but you might actually be able to in, kind of intersperse them with um, improved habitat and those features. Um, so that's kind of like locally, but as we provide increased passage to fish, those fish might then also contribute changes to habitat, both up and downstream. And that's one of the things that we do look at in the assessment phase. Um, and that's, you know, talking about like what potential contaminants they might move. Um, as well as just contributions to future year classes. Very nice. Um, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, one is uh, related to, I, I don't, maybe I missed the first part, but do you have, do you have uh, influx of sediment? Uh, so, so this river, one, one of the, the nice things is there's a naturally occurring um, Drowned river mouth lake that is just upstream that because of all the dam removals, there was a lot of sediment that started to move through the system. And a lot of it is kind of is a sink into Boardman Lake, which is just upstream of the dam. Um, so we don't have a massive amount of sediment transport at this site. Um, but yeah, that is something that at other barriers, it, it, it would be a yeah, much greater was, concern. Yeah, I was thinking whether you need the sediment passage or, or you're dealing with the sediment, because a lot of these uh, traps uh, will, will be 
maybe clouds. I mean, it, there could be a lot of issues. Yeah, there. yeah, and and because we need to maintain a barrier, all the all of the spillway um, or water conveyance structures are all top draw. So we're not conveying a lot of sediment at the site, but historically you also had all top draw. So it's not a change to the the functionality of this portion of the river. Thanks. The yeah. second and last question for me is like, so when you show the, the, the fish velocity, what they could sustain, yep. it seems like the lumbrae were on the, on, the, on the low side. So I was wondering if uh, kind of a convergent uh, uh, channel with increasing velocity would be enough uh, to 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 kind of tire them out and yeah and and what's what's the the kind of caveat between those two data sets that i showed is one the one the fish that were swam out at, at conti um those were atlantic run sea lamprey which are about 25 percent larger so they're able to swim higher speeds than what's shown in here um but yeah like the idea is that you'd be able to tire out sea lamprey assuming they aren't able to attach to the surface because that's the one key that they have is if, if they can attach they can, you know, they can pretty much stay there much longer than a fish that has to actively um, swim to challenge that that same speed. Thank you, Dan. That was an excellent and very um, astounding array <laughs> of assortment. It's been yep. interesting to figure out which ones to use. I had sort of two fisheries related questions. One was. There are native lampreys yep. in the Great Lakes. You didn't really say much. <laughs> That's going to be really tricky if you're getting into that. It, it, they're very similar in morphology, smaller. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are native lamprey that do live upstream of the Eden Street Dam. And that is always a, a concern because they are affected by lamprecide treatment. So if you're able to provide a barrier um, that provides passage to native fish and but blocks sea lamprey, Effectively, you're you're reducing the amount of space that you need to apply those lamprecides that might impact those native species. Um, but in terms of the the native sea lamprey, there's only I think it's the silver lamprey is the only one that actually out migrates, and and it is it is a, a species of concern. But again, it's you know we're our kind of overall goal for this is if we if we can provide passage for even 10% of the fish that are present, that's 10% more than historically, which is zero, and you apply that to other sites. Effectively, you're you're improving the the amount of accessible habitat to fish that have been previously no, blocked. Yeah. Thank yep. <laughs> I had one more question, kind of related to the salmon one. I have more for you tomorrow, but um, <laughs> I've always been, you know, I've done a lot of this kind of work in a much more primitive way. But sediment's an issue, but also the killer always has been. Um, unpredictable weather in the spring when these fish are migrating yep. it's not just sediment it's trees coming down leaves god knows what and yep. usually this in my experience it's been <laughs> very disruptive at the least yeah and, and that's actually a common question i get for, for this um at, at least when it comes to like the large large debris we do have a debris boom that's placed upstream so that is at least diverted away from from the channel and, and will be maintained um, but when it comes to small debris, yeah, I mean, that's going to be an issue with, with any site that you have. Um, but and what we've planned for here is, you know, the Boardman was selected for a number of reasons. One is you have all the, the work that's going on upstream. So there's a lot of influx in interest in being able to provide that passage, but also it's the fact that it's a, a groundwater fed stream and is incredibly stable. Um, if you recall, when I showed that the picture that had discharges since 1952, even though the data dates back to 1952, we haven't technically ever seen a 25-year flood event um, by you know by predictive uh, calculations. So it is incredibly stable. We know kind of what the range of flows are, and the and the site was designed so that we can maintain essentially a 50-50 flow between the fish sorting channel and that bypass channel up to I think it's about a 10-year storm. Um, and because of the the dynamics of the system, you do get those flood flood occurrences, but they're it's a relatively quick um, response time in the system. So it, it pops up and disappears, you know, within the window that fish are moving, but fish are still present and trying to move even outside of those times. So we've tried to en en encapsulate that. And that when I talk about like that time to event analysis, it's really critical because then we can control for, you know, kind of static conditions, like whether the proportion of water going through the fish sorting channel versus the bypass and still accommodate what are the influences of those kind of sporadic 
flooding events um, or increased tailwater, uh, which is an issue we had in the last few years with the Great Lakes, um, and how that might influence their decision-making process. I think we might have some online questions. <laughs> Okay, Judy Yang is wondering, um, how would fish, fish passage affect channel morphology, which is migrating with time? Yeah, so so the again, the, the unique aspect for this site is it's a heavily uh, anthropogenically modified stretch of river. Um, if, if you see the, if I go back to the, the map of the site, oh, wrong way, sorry. Um, the river takes a very unnatural curve to Lake Michigan right at, at the downstream end. Um, you see that like this big curve. That is probably not historically the, the path of, of least resistance for that river, but because of settlement in the late 1800s, that's kind of, you know, the channel's been locked in. Um, so it's lined with a lot of, of uh, sheep piling. It's a fairly constrained channel. It's uh, not very natural, let's say. So you know, by working in this site, yes, we, we understand that, you know, the, the fish sorting channel in itself is very artificial, um, but we've attempted to provide as much kind of natural aesthetics and uh, function in the bypass channel. And like I said before, like one of the things that we might be able to do is we find that, you know, only there's a few distinct tools that work really well in that intersp interspersed uh, locations, we can implement things like natural channel design to be able to get fish from one tool to the next um, that again, at least reflect some of the natural function of the system. It, it's an understanding that any barrier is still gonna be, have anthropogenic effects. Um, and it's just, in this system, it's a little bit more manageable because we know it's already a, a heavily influenced system, but in other sites where, you know, we're talking about replacing barriers so that there's at least some improved capacity for fish passage. But when it comes to sediment transport, it's still gonna be a, a, a significant challenge. Any other questions? So I think, Dan, that was an amazing multifaceted talk, a multifaceted multidisciplinary project involving all of the kind of many emerging trends in, in environmental and civil engineering. Actually, I did have a quick question about the public engagement piece. Yep. So that I think that's a very important element of these projects, and especially with Indigenous peoples. Can you say about how you mentioned them at least twice, the Indigenous kind of inputs? How, how is that? acquired and how are you using that? So, so the, the local tribe, which is the Grand Traverse Band of Chippewa and Otto Indians have been uh, really supportive and, and uh, a participant in this project very early on, even dating back before Fish Pass. So like the, the funding that was acquired to do a lot of the dam removals was actually uh, put up by the, the local tribe. So they've been heavily invested in restoring function to this river system, acknowledging that, you know, that upstream barrier can't just be removed. Um, because of the the issue with sea lamprey, so they've been heavily involved, you know, before we were involved, and then continued through like all of our assessments in the lower river. We do annual surveys. Um, the crew that goes out to do this is all the the tribe's natural resource department. Um, so we are, you know, they're a primary partner in this project, and will as as we move forward. Last last minute, just thank Dan for Thank you.